give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. New time, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting Babel? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. folks, uh, welcome to What Does the Bible Say? Uh, actually, it's Word from the Lord. I, I planned on coming on at 8 o'clock with this, and so that'd be What Does the Bible Say, but a Word from the Lord. Uh, this during tent meeting, we're doing a lot of What Does the Bible Say, and so uh, it doesn't really matter. If you ask What the Bible Say, you always get a Word from the Lord, so uh, What Does the Bible Say usually comes on at 8.30 on Sunday, and uh, Thursdays at 8 o'clock, we're doing a special uh, uh, series of TV program during the tent meeting here with Sam Dilbeck again and we are uh, going to be studying God's Word again and later on at 1030 after the news we're gonna come back Michael Robertson is gonna be joining us and we're gonna be doing religious review live so 1030 to midnight so stay tuned for that but we do want to remind you that the tent meeting is still going on for the HD Simmons you just heard him uh, at 8 o'clock you heard the lesson on faith only let me tell you this is what you're missing this is the kind of preaching you're missing if you're not coming to the tent, and there's one more night uh, of the tent meeting tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, so we encourage you to be there because we're not going to play all of his uh, lessons on TV all the time. You might, it might be hit and miss. We might just put one on now and again, so you may miss it. So you need to get out to the tent and, uh, and uh, participate with us and uh, study the Bible with us. If you have a Bible question, the microphone is always there. Uh, 614 West Church Street. If you have a Bible question after the lesson, you can raise your hand. A microphone will be given to you. And you can ask your question. You can examine the Church of Christ. You can ask your questions. That's what we are told to do is give, be ready to give an answer, 1 Peter 3.15. And so we want to do that very thing. We hope that you will come out and take advantage of uh, uh, the really the pretty nice weather. Absolutely. Really nice weather for, for uh, uh, late June, uh, fixing to be July, last day of June. Uh, I think the high today was uh, not even 90, so uh, sorry for uh, all you folks in Texas uh, who are watching. Uh, yes, we, we didn't break 90 today, I don't think, so it was nice, cool, uh, nice weather under the tent. So come out, be with us, uh, and, and, and examine the Church of Christ. I do want to say this. Here's the good news in all this. Uh, we have knocked 
uh, 8,903 doors. And we passed out 8,903 flyers. Uh, uh, we, we did pass out some in, in parking lots and just uh, uh, people on the street and so forth. But 8,903 flyers, th uh, invitations were given to the tent. And tonight, uh, uh, Brother Billy Williams' mother, the mother Billy Williams, many of you may remember Billy Williams uh, came out of the Pentecostal church. He was uh, 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 ordained, I guess, bishop in the uh, uh, Church of God. And his mother uh, stepped out tonight, obeyed the gospel, and was baptized there at the tent. Brother Michael Robertson baptized her into Christ. And so we say a hearty amen, amen. And, and praise be to God for, for that soul who stepped out and obeyed the gospel. And we're so grateful for her. And we are certainly... Uh, uh, excited for Billy and his family in uh, seeing his mother obey the gospel. She's been coming to some of our Bible studies on Thursday night. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, uh, when, you, uh, when you give people the Bible, oftentimes that's what happens. It works on a good and honest heart, and so that's what we're still striving for. And I, I believe that when we increase the word, uh, you know, Sam, in Acts 6 and verse 7, we, we, we show this a lot. But in Acts 6, verse 7, the, the, the proof that the Bible is right is evident. When you do it, you find out that that's really true. Acts 6, verse 7, the Bible says that the word of God increased and the number of disciples were multiplied. And that's really what we're all about. That's why we're, we're doing this. What did we figure out? 30-something hours, 36 hours. Uh, seems like several weeks of TV. And uh, uh, we're increasing the word. Then we're at the tent, and this is why. Because when you increase the word, the number of disciples multiplies, and that's really what we're after. So uh, we're so grateful for that, excited uh, to hear that news, and um, we're, we're not done yet. We've got one more night of tent meeting, and we want you to come out and be with us. Let me remind you again of our TV times that are going on Thursday night, or Thursday and Friday mornings. Uh, so that was this morning. Tomorrow morning will be the last night, or last morning. I'm, I'm stuck in night, sorry. Uh, 11 a.m., 1 p.m., uh, 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 Sam, I'm, I'm, boy, I hope this is not the way the night's going to go, uh, Sam. I called you Stan for some reason, but uh, uh, tomorrow morning he's going to be uh, presenting a lesson on uh, the Old and, and New Testament, maybe the difference between the Old and New Testament. Uh, one of the callers uh, called in last night was asking questions about that. Very, always a very timely subject because uh, I always say that one of the most uh, uh, confused pages in the Bible, uh, Sam, is, is, is this page right here. You know, this page right here. The one between, the one between, Matthew, and the one between Matthew and Malachi. People just don't understand it. Right. And so, uh, all, difference in the Old New Testament. So that's what Sam's going to be talking about in the morning at 11 a.m. Uh, and so in Martinsville, so tune that in if you're in Martinsville. Also, remember, Tonight, uh, we're going till midnight, so stay tuned right here. And then tomorrow night, 8 to 10 again. So we're still not done with teaching the Bible. We hope that you'll come out to the tent, take advantage of all the effort that's been put forth, and we look forward to seeing you. So we're going to get on into our lesson, uh, <clears throat> and I uh, hope that you are ready for this. Uh, Sam, what, um, what I did with uh, Eric uh, Pitcock, Eric Pitcock and uh, uh, Brother David uh, Gordon were here, right. and uh, I did a little little thing, uh, a little show on on the Word of the Lord last week called First Impressions. And what I did was I, I just played a video clip, probably one that they'd never seen before. Right. And uh, it may be uh, of some comments people make, maybe mm -hmm. some things that a preacher said. Uh, it's just uh, uh, it could be anything. And I just would like to give you get for you to give your first impression on that. And here's okay. why I say that. You know, folks, when we are, are in a position, and what we're trying to put ourselves in is a position to always make sure that we know what is right and wrong. You know, right. Paul said we're either, uh, we're either uh, uh, um, and I just drew a blank in Romans 2, uh, accusing or excusing. Right. We're, we're in the business of making sure if this is right or this is wrong. Right. Some of them say, well, we can't judge, but we do it all the time. You know, we make a judgment call Absolutely. On, on a lot of things. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. You know, I always, always refer back to the judging 
idea, you know, people say, well, we can't judge, you know, and of course, you know, probably the most abused passage in the Bible, Matthew 7, you know, exactly. uh, judge not lest you be judged and so forth like that. But, you know, um, the Bible says to go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every living creature. And even those who are denominational leaders uh, see a necessity of going out and teaching and preaching the gospel. But, you know, one thing that you have to do if you're going to preach the gospel is you've got to judge somebody as lost. You know, that's a judgment call. Exactly that's, right. that's part of the discernment. And, of course, our discernment needs to be based upon the Word of God. And so we look at someone's lifestyle. Uh, maybe we see it from afar. We don't know them very well. And we say, you know, there's someone who needs the gospel. We make a judgment call. And so when a Baptist or a Methodist or Presbyterian or anyone uh, sees someone and they try to go and convert them, uh, they, they judge that person as lost. Mm -hmm. um, I guess because they don't overtly say that that person is lost, that it's simply implied by their actions. Maybe uh, some people find it less offensive, but, uh, you know, the fact is people are lost. Well, and two, a lot of, a lot of people that, that uh, uh, we interact with, you know, they wouldn't, they might not even say that those persons are lost. They won't say everybody's going to heaven, but still they've made a judgment in saying that even. You know, right. they've still made a judgment in saying that, well, everybody's safe. So they've, they've actually, you know, given everybody a pass, and they want to condemn us for what they call judging. Right. And in doing that, they've just judged us. Absolutely. So, uh, but also in Hebrews chapter 5, and this is why we want to do this, friends, because we want to show you that when you, uh, when you are studying God's Word, what you're doing is you are preparing yourself to make some judgments. And look at this. In Hebrews, this is Hebrews 5, we'll, we'll back up to verse <clears throat> 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. Right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the word of righteousness. And then he says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, if you're not up on the word of God... You're not going to have the exercise. You're not going to be able to say, Absolutely. this is right, this is wrong, this is good and evil. Absolutely. So what we're, this is really going to be is, it, this is going to be to show you that, you know, when you have your, ex, when you have your senses exercised on the Word of God, mm -hmm. and you know what is right versus what is wrong, you'll be able to, you may be able to find some things that are wrong that no one else has picked out. Right. Well, Hebrews 4.12 is the same idea, you know, uh, uh, just a, a chapter before that uh, when he says that the, the Word of God is, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is, notice this, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of heart. And the word discern there is the, the same concept of judging. Uh, the word helps us to discern or judge the thoughts and the intents of a person's heart, uh, whether he is... Uh, uh, one who is wanting to do what God says or not wanting to do what God exactly. says. Exactly. And of course, Paul's statement, one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when he says that uh, we are to test ourselves or examine ourselves whether we are in the faith or whether we are a reprobate. And so uh, this uh, uh, self-examination, or we use the word introspection because intro meaning in and, and uh, spect meaning the, uh, carry the idea of to see or to look. So introspection is to look within and to see mm -hmm. uh, who are we? Where are we in relationship to the Word of God? And, and I, I guess, you know, uh, one of the best places to start judging is right here. Right. You know, uh, you know people say, well, I don't like you because you judge. Well, let me tell you, the person I judge most is me. Right. And sadly, I often fall short of, of what I know the Word of God says. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you, I offend myself sometimes at, at how harshly I have to judge myself. Well, isn't that the, 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 the abuse verse you mentioned a while ago, Matthew 7, isn't that what it's really saying is, it's not, it's not that it's wrong to judge. It's just to beware that you're going to be held to the same standard. Well, we're saying Absolutely. in the Church of Christ, we're saying you can judge us because we, we're trying to hold everybody else up to this standard, and that's the standard we want to be held to. Absolutely. So go ahead and judge us. Just make sure that you're judging by this standard, not by something yeah. that you've devised. So there's, there's even a passage in uh, 1 John 3, uh, I believe it's verse uh, 18 or verse 20, I'm going to have to look. It's verse 20. He says, uh, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Uh, God knows even those th things that 
that sometimes we forget about that right. we have done. Uh, God is judging us, and He's holding us to a standard. And, and the, the idea in, in 1 John 3 is that we ought to be looking at ourselves, same thing that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 that we already looked at, as, as we examine ourselves, and he says, you know, if, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Exactly. If our heart condemns us, not, then we have confidence towards God. And so uh, we, we use judging. We recognize the, the importance of judging uh, in this life. And isn't it true uh, along those lines what we said uh, to the caller last night about the conscience? Mm -hmm. You know, your heart may not condemn you, right. but it may be because you haven't exercised your thoughts and intents upon the Word of God. Absolutely. And so it doesn't condemn you. I mean, you think, well, it's all right. Well, maybe you need to make sure that your, your heart or your conscience is lined up with what God says is right and wrong. So well, we're, we're going to do a little exercising. Okay. And, uh, and I want to see what, what you think about, about some of these things. It may be something you hear. Now, I've heard some of these clips several times, and some of them okay. I haven't heard in a long time. Okay. And so you may pick up something that, that uh, I even missed. And uh, uh, different topics. This is, a, uh, this is a show called Ask the pastor. It airs out of Greensboro, and all okay. of these all these guys on this panel are uh, are local so-called pastors. And uh, you you can call into this program. You don't get to interact with them. You call right. in, ask your question, they they cut you off. So uh, that's why we say this is you know this is a true call-in program. We get yeah. we interact. But uh, listen to what the, what the question is, and then listen to some of their answers, and you you uh, just give us your thoughts on this. Okay. Uh, I have two questions here that pastors actually love to get a hold of, and it concerns tithing. Go pastors. <laughs> Should I tithe from my unemployment check and from my retirement fund? That's question number one. And the second question was from Paige and Winston, the first one from Jim and Eden. Uh, Paige asked, Should people still pray for people who do not tithe? Let's take the first one from Jim or Tim, whichever. Should I tie for unemployment and retirement? You got the question. I got the question. Okay. Yes, Chaplain. <laughs> well, that depends. Would you like the blessings of the Lord? <laughs> if you do, you'll want to tie, regardless of how little or how much you have. And I, what was the second question? I, I immediately. People pray for people who do not tie. <laughs> You know, I can think of more serious things to pray about, but if you see somebody struggling and you know that they're not tithing, uh, you might certainly pray for that and encourage that. But, um, you know, let the, let the Spirit of the Lord lead that person because it's not until we are truly listening to the Lord and listening to His Spirit inside of us that we can appreciate the importance of tithing, both in the Old and the New Testament. We see it given to us in different ways. So do you want the blessing? Do you truly want the Lord to uh, return to you tenfold, pouring out, pouring over? Um, then, then do the right thing. Do what the Scriptures tell us to do. The chaplain did real good with that. What about it, pastors? Yeah, she did great. She did, um, <laughs> you know, the... the and now, I won't stop right there with my yeah. listeners that guy, but... What, what do you think about that? Should you tithe your retirement and your unemployment? Well, I, I think the first thing you've got to look at is the concept of tithing to begin with. Okay. It's, uh, it's an Old Testament doctrine, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 6, uh, beginning in verse, verse uh, 1, he says that, uh, uh, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, uh, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again, notice this, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of, of, he goes on in verse 2, of, of instructions about washing, and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. This uh, uh, we will not do if God permits. And so there's this uh, uh, laying again of the of the old law there's no reason to lay again the old law uh, and uh, uh, to, to put back those uh, uh, those that foundation from the dead works of the old law um, a lot of people continue to struggle with that of course that's going to be the topic of my show tomorrow but uh, we can give a little bit of a preview here uh, the book of Hebrews is really about a a, a contrast between the old law mm -hmm. and the new law and uh, uh, you know the uh, there, there's a betterness to the, the new law. Right. And uh, this, you know, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers and the prophets, uh, or, or spake unto the, uh, to the fathers by the prophets. And then, of course, but now he speaks to us how? 
Through his, son. through his son. That's Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. And so, uh, you know, the very opening proposition of the book of Hebrews is there's a contrast between the old law and the new law. And tithing was an Old Testament uh, 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 ritual. It was, it was one of the things that was commanded. I uh, believe the, the word literally means to take a tenth part. Um, and under the Old Testament system, they had to sacrifice or give a tenth part of their income to God. And of course, at various times during the, the history of Israel, we see where they were failing to do that. Uh, oh, there's a passage in Micah, or I'm sorry, in Malachi 3 uh, and verse 10, where God challenges them to get back on path uh, with, with giving everything you're supposed to do. And he says, bring ye the tithe, or all the tithe, into the storehouse, uh, that there may be, what, uh, uh, meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. Set the Lord of hosts, if, you, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that there will not be in room enough to hold it or to receive it. I mean, this is, this is a great challenge by God, isn't it? Right. Uh, he's looking at His people who have who've neglected what He's asked for. Uh, they're, they're turning away from the law. Ironically, by Malachi, they, they don't seem to be committing idolatry anymore, but they, they do still have uh, some issues with uh, uh, understanding what God wants. And uh, so He's challenging, bring the whole tithe, bring it all. And God says, you put me to the test. You know, here we were talking about judging earlier right. and testing. That's right. God says, you put me to test. And you see, if I don't open the, the windows of heaven and pour out so many blessings, that you will not have enough room to store them. Uh, so there's, there's the Old Testament system of tithing. Now, when we come to the New Testament, though, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, uh, we are to lay by in store upon the, the first day of the week. Uh, uh, some have questioned, well, well, well you know, when is that supposed to happen? Well, it's the first day of every week. Um, there, there's an implication that uh, if the, the uh, qualifier of every is not there, then uh, uh, it is to be assumed. Right. And, uh, or, it, you know, uh, hermeneutically anyway, we would put it in there upon the first day of every week. Let every one of you play by him in store. Unless, of course, there's a reason not to accept that, which in this case, there's no reason not to understand it that way. And, and I think most denominations... Uh, still take up a collection every week, don't they? Uh, I think uh, that, yeah, I think most of them take and, it up several times a week. And, and that's probably true. But uh, uh, So the idea, first of all, with the, with the caller and the question there is, is the, the contrast between tithing of the Old Testament system, which is done away with, uh, and, and the, the <coughs> giving of our means as we have prospered. Uh, there, there's a lot of verses in, in 2 Corinthians 8, uh, and also, uh, uh, well, let's just turn over to 2 Corinthians 8 real quick, uh, beginning in verse 1. There's, there's great passages here about how we are to give, uh, or the the attitude with which we give and, and the reasons with which we give. Uh, uh, he says, uh, let me get there myself. Uh, he says, uh, we, we want you to know, brothers, uh, we, uh, our, our brethren, we do you to wit of the, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. This, Paul says, we did not expect, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And so uh, uh, here's this, this beautiful uh, uh, depiction of those who were of Macedonia who were, were trying to give uh, to God. They didn't have much. He says that they were in severity, deep poverty and affliction. And he says they begged us to take it. Right. Now, uh, overlooking or, or moving on from this, this uh, the idea of tithing and versus uh, the giving of the first day of the week, let's, let's answer the question as if they asked the right question, which would have been, should I give uh, out, you know, uh, upon the first day of the week, should I give to the Lord out of my retirement checks, out of my pension plans, and out of things like that? Um, have you prospered? Yeah. And, and if the answer is yes, then you should be giving. And uh, uh, you think of, of Mark twelve forty two when the widow cast in her two mites. Uh, how much did she have? Jesus said, what? That was it. Right. She gave all she had. Uh, you may say, well, you know, I've got to live on that pension. Of course you do. No, no one's saying uh, that you've got to give all. But isn't it interesting that, that those of great spiritual faith 
ended up giving much more than they could ever afford. Right. I, I think another thing too to, that I, I find interesting is uh, when these questions are asked, these particular you know pastors. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the focus from these guys always seems to be upon, you know, we got to make sure the money stays coming in. And, uh, you know, that's because you know that they're real concerned about the well drying up. Yeah. You know, we've got, there's, there's uh, preachers, so-called pastors up in Martinsville that were actually uh, insisting, putting pressure on elderly uh, people to mortgage their houses so they could build these great lavish, you know, mm -hmm. buildings. And... Yeah. Uh, you know, you're right about the prospering, but I would also consider this, you know, is it the case that, you know, maybe you've already tithed on some of this too? No, you know, I mean, they've, they've insisted yeah. that you tithe. Right. So, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, like we said, we're saying prosper. You know, right. if you've got some prosper coming in, but uh, you give as you prospered. It's a free will offering. But when it comes to tithing, well, they've already insisted these people tithe on the first, the first time. Yeah. You know the first uh, uh, gross income. Mm -hmm. Now we want to tithe again and tithe again and tithe again, which right. we know that they're really concerned about making sure that everybody right. gets the money. So, but you're right. If you if you put the pri biblical principles in place, yeah. all right, we're prospering. Now you give as much as you prospered and as you purpose. Right. Um, let's uh, let's look at one more verse here, Sam, on 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 tithing, and that's First uh, Corinthians nine. And verse seven, mm -hmm. uh, I think this verse just knocks the soup out of uh, uh, of tithing, mm -hmm. because everything that Paul puts here is contrary to tithing. Okay, if you think about that. A a every man, as he purposes in his heart. Mm -hmm. Well, if the pastor tells you that you have to tithe, yeah. Well, number one, he's purposed, purposed in his heart, not he's, yours. That's right. He's purposed for you. <laughs> okay. All right. So let him give, not grudgingly. Mm -hmm. Well, you're telling me how much I have to give of my check. I know when when the when the Uncle Sam comes around and says this is how much you have to give. I, I don't want to give it. You know, I like to keep all that I can. Right. Uh, in regard to that, so now he's made you give grudgingly, and he's made it a giving of necessity because mm -hmm. you have to give it. Mm -hmm. And now you're not cheerful, right? Because right. he's he's twisting my arm to give it, and. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I've heard preachers say uh, that they know their members lie to them about how much they get, how much they make, because if they really did give a ten percent, you know they're on a very limited income, right. elderly women, whatever. If they really gave a ten percent of their small income, you know they might not have enough room, uh, money for their medicines or for their utilities, right. whatever. So they lie about how much they make just so they can give less. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at how wise God is in putting some of these phrases in the Bible that right. just really go contrary to what man says. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Of course, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not obviously from Texas. I, I, you know, I'm from Texas, not from here. I don't right. know exactly what's going on here as far as uh, uh, preachers and, and church leaders, religious leaders, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, taking from people and mm -hmm. insisting and things like that. Uh, but, you know, uh, giving really is a very private thing. It really is. Uh, and, and it's between you and your family and God. Uh, you know, as a, as a head of a household myself, uh, my wife and I, we sit down, uh, we discuss, you know, what we're making as a combined income. Uh, we decide first and foremost what we want to give to God. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that's a private decision that we make. And then uh, whatever's left, we, we take out house payments, car payments, grocery payments, medical payments, whatever, uh, you know, because it's, it's about prioritizing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we give first and foremost to God. And God, God has always supplied our need. I, right. I can confidently say God has always <clears throat> supplied our need. That's right. Well, and, uh, and of course, I, you know, I know I'm mentioning, you know, local preachers here, but you know, I think we both would, would recognize that the, uh, the, the uh, false doctrine of tithing, you know, reaches uh, all through the denominational world. I mean, you got guys like Joel Osteen down in right. Houston and T.D. Yeah. Jakes and all these guys, and that's, you know, that's their bread and butter. And uh, yeah. it's, it's making sure Something's people... Something's got to pay for the Crystal Cathedral. I, I guess so, <laughs> yeah. We, can, we can't afford the... And we can't afford uh, uh, the great uh, sports coliseums for our church buildings, if if uh, if the money dries up, so that's right. Well, let's uh, let's get it. Let's get another one here. 
Now, this next one, this is definitely a, a this is a local guy. Uh, he's on the local, or was on the local uh, uh, TV station that was run by members of the uh, Mercy Crossing Church of God, mm -hmm. and uh, his name's Stephen Tinch. And uh, uh, someone's going to ask him a, a question, and uh, let's just listen to hit the question and then the answer. Stop at any point. You can tell me stop at any point if you okay. hear something you want to comment on. You got it. Right. I would just have one question. Sure. I've seen, you know, I'm not going to mention no names, but mm -hmm. so many doctrines that are not biblical, mm -hmm. you know, being preached on stations, and yeah. it's like, you know, they're, they're saying God can't use women to preach or teach. Mm -hmm. You know, they say God, you, the Holy Spirit can't live in people today, the indwelling of the Spirit. And right. you see those people, you know, being led wrong. Yeah. But you want to do something about it, how would you do that? I know you could pray and ask God. Well, brother, what we have to do is, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I've thought about this, you know, uh, many times. Um, what we have to do is we just have to, we have to be even stronger in our faith. We have to get into God's Word even more and, and declare the Word of God in the midst of all the controversy. And we have to love those. You know, we're not going to use this, this program, or I'm not going to use any program I'm on to, to call names or to come out at people. But I think, and so the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, if, if these things have passed away, then prove it to me with Scripture. And there are no Scriptures to prove that fact. In fact, uh, I've had uh, Baptist brethren and, and, and others from denominations that did not believe uh, in miracles or, or miraculous power. Uh, but they still could not prove from Scripture. And the one Scripture that they give from 1 Corinthians chapter several, 13 I mean, really it's, does it's not... It's just amazing to me. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, Go ahead. You know, we probably could have stopped it after the first yeah. thing when the man was saying that, uh, uh, you know, there are some who are teaching that uh, uh, women cannot be preachers. Well, uh, <laughs> You know, I guess I would be teaching that because that's what the Bible says. Exactly right. And if we keep going back to what does the Bible say, uh, we know that that that, that women are to uh, keep silent in the church. What is that? First Corinthians fourteen verse twenty six, uh, that they are uh, to uh, uh, keep their uh, literally it is to keep their mouth shut or to remain silent is what it says. Uh, uh, is that the one that I was looking for? No. Which one am I looking for? Help me out, James. Uh, Thirty. Uh, is it? It's 30, 28, no, 28, 30, 34, 34. Yes, there we go, 34. Uh, he says that the women are to keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but uh, should be in submission, as, as the law also says. And so, uh, uh, you know, he says that, you know, he, he hasn't read any scriptures that would change that. Um, my, my, uh, there's, I'm, I'm only left to conclude one thing. One, he doesn't read his Bible, or two, he's lying. Um, and it is kind of sad to say, you know, uh, here he is a religious leader and he hasn't read his Bible. Uh, and I, I don't know if he's still in the area or not, but uh, hopefully by now he's started reading his Bible and he's read passages like that. Uh, the same with the indwelling of the Spirit. Uh, of course, you know, we've, we've, we've talked, talked about we've that quite a bit quite a in bit. the last few, uh, this, this week and so. Uh, there is an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt. Uh, we we asked the question, how? Uh, we've said that His influence is, is mitigated by the Word or His influence impacted through the Word. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we didn't, we didn't get into it too much, but the idea of uh, uh, miracles, you know, he's saying, well, you know, uh, you, know, they're, you know, they have the ability to do these miracles. Well, uh, miracles have ceased. In fact, uh, uh, there's there's lengthy discussion beginning in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've already looked at 14, which is right in the middle of this discussion. But uh, let's go back to chapter 12 and verse 4 uh, when, when he says, uh, it says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Uh, there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And that's the common good of the church. It's the, the building up of the church. We've often likened it uh, as miracles are like scaffolding uh, to a building. Uh, once the building is completed, the scaffolding is taken away. Once the, uh, well, you know, the church has been built, the scaffolding of the miraculous works is taken away. Now he says what these uh, gifts are, beginning in verse 8, he says, To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. 
to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongue, to another the interpretation of tongues. And, and so you have this, this list of, of, of nine different miraculous gifts that the people had uh, in the first century in order to build up the church. Now the church at Corinth was having a, a lot of trouble with this because they're, they're fighting over it. He says, uh, uh, well, you have tongues. Well, you know, tongues, that, that doesn't hold a candle uh, to the gift of prophecy. And then they were dividing over it. Uh, uh, all of those who have prophecies, come over here and we'll have our little group and we'll be better than everybody else. And, and we'll make all the tongue speakers over there. And the tongue speakers, of course, were highly offended by that. And they were saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, what makes prophecy better than, than tongue speaking? We're the best. And, and they're bickering and fighting over, over who has the best gift. And, and Paul, at the end of chapter 12, verse 30 and 31 there, uh, he says that there is a, uh, uh, he, he says, uh, uh, do all possess gifts of healing? Do, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. There is something better than miracles. It is the motivation of, 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 of study, conviction, and conversion, provocation, and righteousness, uh, the key to fellowship. What is it? Verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. And so he says, he says here you're, you're dividing and, 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 and you know, bickering and complaining against one another. He says, but, but there is a, a better way, a more excellent way, higher gifts, something that is higher and greater than all of the miraculous gifts. What is it? Love. 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 And, and he uses, uh, in fact, he, he mentions the speaking in tongues in verse 1, uh, he, he, the prophetic powers in verse 2, uh, understanding, this is a miraculous understanding of all mysteries, a miraculous knowledge, a miraculous faith in verse 2. If, if I have those things and do not have love, it's worthless to me. If I do something as great as giving up my body, of course, Jesus said, no greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his friend, John 15, 13. Paul says, if I do that, I don't have love. It's worthless. worthless. And so he goes into this, this uh, you know, teaching of what, the, the, what love is, what true love is. And, and the kind of love that God wants to see all of us have to see us as Christians share in. Now notice, as we get down to chapter 13 then, in verse 8, he says... Love never ends. And his love doesn't run out. There's not a, a limited supply of love. And as we drain off a court today, we're a court lower today than we were right. uh, yesterday. And no, love never ends or never fails. But he says, where there be what? Prophecies. What was that? That was one of the miraculous gifts mentioned in chapter 12. Where there, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge... It shall vanish away. Now, a lot of people misunderstand that idea. They think, well, knowledge, uh, well, 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 you know, we, we were looking forward to heaven when we have all knowledge. No, there he's talking specifically about the miraculous knowledge that he mentions, mentions in chapter 12 in that, in that list of all the, the, uh, uh, the gifts. In verse 8, he says there's an utterance of wisdom and an utterance of knowledge. That's the knowledge he's referring to. Right. And he says, it's going to be done away with. It's going to end. Uh, there is a limit on these gifts. Not that God is limited, but that God himself has limited their use and their time span. Love, though, never fails. Love right. never runs out. There's not a, a, a time in which it will be done. So in verse 9 he says, we know in part, miraculous knowledge again, and, and we prophesy in part. Uh, part is, is uh, uh, you know, if, if you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle and you pick up a piece and you would say, uh, you wouldn't say this is the whole puzzle. You would say what? This is part of the puzzle. But this in and of itself is incomplete. The miracles were incomplete. 
and they were there specifically to help with the maturity of the church. And he says, these things are going to be done away. When I was a child, I, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up those childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. But these three are these three. But the greatest of these is, in fact, love. And, and so there's this uh, uh, big discussion on the miraculous gifts. And he says, look, uh, those miracles are going are gonna to go away. They're going to be finished. And, and in the end, what's going to remain is love. Right. And that's what they needed to understand. Now, folks, this is what I want you to see here. When you are exercised in the Word, and this is one why, why we're talking about. We're trying to get you to open the Bible. You may hear something like what Steve Tinch said, and it may just go in one and out of the other, and you think, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Um, You've got, you got, to be, you got to be careful what you hear because you may think, well, there's nothing wrong with it. But then if you've exercised and you're trained to listen, you'll know what's wrong. I have a friend... He, he gets in my car and he go, he'll, he'll stop. One day he stopped and he, he leaned down and he said, you got a little tick in your motor. You know, and it's like, what? What, what do you mean? You know, I just, I don't pay attention to it. Well, he's, he's worked on motors enough so he knows. You know, he said, well, you know, you might, you might check something. You know, maybe a belt or whatever. Maybe, you know, you may need to check your oil or whatever. He's, you know, he puts out things that it might be because he's exercised his senses to to, to uh, be in tune with what a uh, well-running uh, engine sounds like. So what Sam has done, I mean, he just went through uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, and all because of what he heard uh, Stephen Tench say. Yeah. Now, as we both said, there was, there was a lot of stuff going on in that, in that <laughs> thing. I, I, here's, what, here's one of the things that I picked up on, too, is, is that we were talking about judging earlier. Now, yeah. Stephen said, well, I'm not going to use any program I'm on to come out against anybody. Or to call names. Or to call names. That's right. That was the one to get to. But the, uh, but the, but the next thing he did was, was what? Uh, he, he called, or uh, he's condemning others who teach it. That's right. He came out against said, him. my boy Baptist, don't believe that. Yeah. Well, he, he, number one, he called names, and two, he came out against them in the sense of saying, you know, show me the scripture. They must be teaching yeah. something wrong. I didn't even pick up on that, but uh, oh, the inconsistency there, but that's a good yeah. point. But, uh, uh, you know, this idea, you know, that uh, calling names is somehow bad. Um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the fact that my wife changed her name to my name when we got married. Uh, names do mean something. Right. And uh, I think of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning about uh, verse 19. Uh, or actually, we'll go back to verse 18. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18. Uh, he says that... Uh, uh, I charge, or this, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, or commit to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, uh, uh, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith. Then he specifically says what? Uh, they, by rejecting... Uh, uh, by rejecting this, they have made shipwreck of the faith. Now notice verse 20. Uh, he says, among whom are... Hymenaeus and Alexander. Right. You know, it, it, I would hate to be Hymenaeus or Alexander and have my name recorded for an eternity because I made shipwreck of the faith. Right. Paul, Paul called names. Jesus called names. Peter called names. You, you, names are there for a reason. Exactly right. So you can identify what you're talking about. In, in his second epistle to uh, Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy uh, he, he calls names again, and I had it in my hand just a moment ago. Maybe it's in chapter 2. How many is in Philetus? Uh, uh, Homogenes and, yeah. yeah it's, it's second, I just had it in my... It's, it's Second Timothy. Yeah, it's 2 Timothy. Uh, Boy, that's embarrassing. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Sam, if we had that miraculous knowledge, we, would, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't have to worry about things like this. That's right. Uh, it would, you know, it'd be given to us. We we would yeah. have, um, uh, we would know. I'm, I'm in. Uh, well, well second, I, in Second Timothy. Oh, here we go. Uh, chapter well, chapter four. He talks about uh, Alexander the coppersmith who did him great right. harm. Of course, back in uh, in, in Ephesus. But uh, uh, there's another one, and, and I, I I'm just not seeing it. Although 
moments ago I had my finger in, 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 in the spot to not forget it and well I regardless it. I mean I know what you're talking, talking about there, he's, he's identifying individuals that uh, that are teaching false doctrine or are, are leading people astray the mm -hmm. Apostle John does the same thing he writes a letter sends it by the hand of Gaius and says right. watch out for diatrophies right you know so he's condemning these people right. and you know you know uh, Sam when it comes down to uh, uh, religious names uh, what we do on this program a lot is we will put what uh, the Baptist manual or the Methodist discipline says up there and it's not what we're saying that they wrote it yeah you know so don't get mad if I put it up there they're they're not ashamed of it enough to yeah. put it in print yeah. so I shouldn't be ashamed to read it and tell yeah. you what it says so you want to take a, a absolutely let's go phone ahead and call. okay here we go you on the word from the Lord yeah, I just have a comment. How you, how you mean God doing today? Doing well, well, thank you. Uh, I just uh, had one comment, no argument, nothing. I just said, when you talk about miracles don't happen now, it's modern day. Mm -hmm. have, you, uh, have you ever saw your child being birthed into this world and the doctor hands you that child? Don't that look like a miracle of God? He hands you that child. And when you, like, you go to sleep at nighttime and you shut your eye and you wake up. In that miracle, God. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, every piece the, of bread. Hang on. All right, caller, you asked a question. Let him uh, answer. The, the question is, is, is the miracle of birth. And, and certainly that is something that we, we hear a lot today about miracle of birth. And, and I don't want to take anything away from the amazing uh, feat and accomplishment that God does in, in birth. Wow, that's that's truly amazing. I, I have two sons myself. Uh, I was there when they were I was there when they were born uh, to to hold that child in my arms the first time. It, it you know I I broke down and wept. Uh, I remember uh, uh, calling my mom at the birth of my first son, and uh, I, I couldn't even get words out of my mouth. There was just a uh, and my mom said, "Did you have a baby?" And all I could do, uh, you know, because I'm blubbering like a baby. But understand this: a miracle by definition. Uh, this is this is not uh, uh, me. Uh, this is not James. This, by definition, a miracle was something that defied natural law. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, birth, or conception and to birth is as natural as anything else. And so by definition, it's not really a miracle. We use miracle, I think, in an, in an accommodative way uh, today in our modern English. But uh, understand that as amazing as it is, it doesn't really rise theologically to the point of a miracle. But it is, it is amazing. And as far as sleeping, again, uh, that's as, as natural as the body. It has to have rest. Uh, but I, I'm like you probably. I, every morning I wake up and I thank God that my eyes did open. But, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd like to ask you this, caller. Do you think that they were not having babies in Jesus' day? Oh, yeah, but like I said, my wife, they told my wife a long time ago that she can have children. One time she, two times she got pregnant and she had a miscarriage. Uh -huh. And this time, she, the doctor told her she could never, ever have a child. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking at my little girl. They said, doctor said okay. she would never, ever have a but, child. But, here, but, here's, but I, here's what we're saying, though, sir. She, the, it still went through the natural process. Though the doctor said her body would not be able to br give birth to a child she was now that that is definitely great that's great news and, and congratulations on that but absolutely here's the thing they were having babies when jesus was performing miracles and no one no one was beating down the door of people who were having babies and saying well look it's a miracle but when jesus healed a man and put his ear back on or when he raised the dead or when he made the line uh, the lame to walk they all, they came and sought him out where he was because he was doing something that no one had ever seen before. And I can right. guarantee you that people have been having babies since Adam and Eve first gave birth. So, and and I, would, I would add this too. You know, doctors are amazing. They go, they're very well educated, well studied, and things like that. But uh, I, I know several doctors, good friends of mine, and they'll be the first to tell you that there's a lot of things they don't understand, and they are amazed by what the human body can do to repair itself right. when they thought nothing else could be done. And so uh, uh, my, my question would be, uh, you know, if you want to call that a, a miracle, would be, you know, uh, in order for that to be a miracle would be 
uh, for your daughter to have been born without the natural process of, of a man and a woman coming together, conception being made, the gestation mm -hmm. of nine months, and then the birth. Uh, you, you've got to take that process out of the way uh, so that uh, your wife would not have known a man and then somehow got pregnant right. and then mm -hmm. gestated that baby and then gave birth. That would be a miracle because right. that would defy natural law. And, and, and again, we're not trying to take anything away from your experience and the amazement that, that you feel toward your daughter, but um, let, let's call something by what it is. It, it's still within the natural law. It's not technically a miracle, although we might use it in that accommodative sense and say right. that was truly amazing right. what God has done. Right. Okay, well, I hope that helps, sir. Yeah, you have a good night. All right, thank you. Huh? All right. You yeah. want a word from the Lord? Yes. Um, you have up on the screen the King James version of the Bible. Yes, ma'am. What Bible is the other man reading from? I, I'm reading from the English Standard Version from uh, 2003. I knew it was different because it's changed the words of the King James Version. Mm -hmm. Where you was putting the, the word love in the King James Version, it says charity. Right. Well, today, I today I, I would just say... In our, in our more modern language today, uh, we don't normally say, you know, uh, I, I cherish you. We say, I, I love you. And, right. uh, and so the ESV, which is a, a modern language translation, which I would, I'll be the first to admit there, that there are some problems with it as a translation. But overall, as far as a modern language translation goes, it's very good. It's very accurate uh, in, in its translation. Uh, and, and that's not to take anything away from the King James Bible, which I personally believe is the best Bible in in English ever produced but uh, uh, you know there's there's just some uh, uh, archaic language in it that uh, we don't use very much anymore and so I choose to use uh, an English standard version well you know Sam th this is and uh, I'd say this is why uh, we get this a lot mm -hmm. you know and a lot of and what I find very interesting is everybody wants to make sure we're using the King James Version <laughs> and we are but yeah. then but then it's like okay now that now that you like the, the version that we're using Will you still obey it? You know, and so uh, absolutely. But, but but that's why we, you know, that's why we we like to use King James because everybody recognizes it, just like you said. Right. Everybody recognizes it. Who who mm -hmm. loves the Bible recognizes right. it as as a. A, the high standard, or absolutely. the high standard in the English version. It so. is, it is the standard, and, and any new translation well, today, they they compare it to word, the King James. The word I'm talking about, he was replacing the word charity with love. love. Yeah. And right. yes, we do use the word charity a whole lot nowadays. Right. Just because of the uh, financial situation that everybody's but, but in. But I think he's saying in the same and context, we don't say. We use charity right. in the sense of giving to uh, the needy, you know, helping the, the poor, poor or things like that. Right. But and that's not really what and, First Corinthians is talking about. Right. And I believe, I believe that that's what they were, God was talking about in the Bible. Uh, well, not, not actually in that love, verse. He I mean, would have said love. Well, if we're going to get technical about it, uh, the word charity in the King James actually replaces the original Greek word agape. So, uh, you, know, it, you know, what it means is love, a sacrificial love. And uh, our modern word charity, and that's one of those uh, uh, words that have changed meanings through the, through the years. Uh, charity, when the King James translators used it, by the way, this is the 400-year birthday of the King James Bible. It's been around 400 years ago. Wow. But 400 years ago, in the English language, charity meant what love means today. And charity today doesn't mean what charity meant back whenever that word was translated. Uh, so a, a, a modern understanding would, but, would be there. But, but two, it goes, again, it goes back to what we started off talking about earlier about being able to discern. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you studied your Bible, you know, some of these uh, old English words, uh, you, you figure out the meaning. You realize, hey, that doesn't make sense today. Like right. some places the, the King James says, you know, let your conversation be seen. Right. Well, wait, how do you see you see words coming in mountain? No, I'm talking about manner of life, the way you live. So it's like the old get smart cone of silence, where the words will pop up above exactly. when you speak them. You know. So, uh, uh, it's, but but you know, you, but you heard him say, ma'am, that you know he he recognizes the King James is the is the uh, the greatest English version. So uh, 
but just know, you know, that on, what, on the word of the Lord, that's, this is definitely what we're always going to get is, is the King James. So, all right. Well, Good I got question, a, though. I appreciate I, it. I, I've got another call, so thank you for your call. Okay. Yes, that was, you're welcome. You're on the word of the Lord. Good evening. How are you? Doing very Doing well. Fine. Good. I have just recently started watching your program. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a local person. Okay. And I was wondering if there were any way that you could enlarge the top portion of your scriptures. I have a hard time keeping up with the, what you're going from chapter to chapter and book to book. Oh, oh I no. see. Yeah. Me. Uh, I don't keep up. I, the top I'll try. portion is where you have your books and chapters, and I can't right. see it. I, I see right. that, yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll have to try. I don't know that I can do it right now, but I will. I will try to look into that and and see if it's possible. I'm, you're talking about this part right up here where uh, it says the chapter and the verse, and uh, I'll always try to tell you. Uh, but the the little blue spot right there where you see it, that's where we type it in. And uh, I don't know, maybe something we do in the preferences, uh, but I, I don't I don't think it's going to be that much help. We'll just have to try to tell you this is 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8. Uh, okay. uh, we like this Bible program uh, because we can enlarge the, the font of the text, uh -huh. uh, you know, but as far as the, the places where we put the references and, and things like that, that's, uh, I don't know. Well, yeah. are you using eSword? No, it's not eSword. It's called uh, uh, Power Bible CD, and uh, they're they're really inexpensive. Uh, I, I could probably give you a toll-free number, and you can call and order them. I think if you order uh, several of them, they're they're just like five or six dollars. They're not not that much at all, and they have all kinds of uh, neat gadgets on it. But uh, we like it because we can enlarge the text, and and uh, you know I, I think that's. And, and, and uh, Sam, that's one thing people know about us is mm -hmm. we put the Bible up here. That's right. why under the tent, ma'am, under the tent, when we have our tent meetings, we have a screen where we just project the Bible so that you can always see the Scripture. You can know that, you know, when we say here's a verse, we put it up there. Right. You can read it. And, uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to get a word from the Lord, we, we, uh, we want to make sure that that's exactly what we're getting. Do, so, do you use eSword? Yes. Okay. I, I've used these for many years. I find the program very interesting, and I, I, I want to keep up with it because it is scripture and text. Right. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, you say you're in the area. Are you in Reedsville or Eden or? Reedsville. Reedsville. Okay. Well, we uh, we we regularly meet in Eden. I, I'm the I'm the preacher in Eden, and uh, we're at 250 Boulevard. If you'd like to come up and, and study the Bible with us on Sundays or Thursdays. Uh, we'd be glad to we'd be glad to have you. Or we we come out and have a Bible study with you, and we use the same, you know, the same uh, uh, concept. We we put the scriptures up there so you can see them. So uh, thank you for your invitation. Yeah, and uh, I'm in Corsicana, Texas. If you want to drive out that far, you're welcome to come see us as well. Sam <laughs> Sam's visiting us from Texas. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so, uh, appreciate well, your appreciate call. You, appreciate you watching. You're welcome, and you are popular. It took me a little bit to get through. Uh, well, 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 that means people are watching. We appreciate that. Okay. So you have a nice evening. All right. you Thank too. you. All right. All right, that's a very good caller, and you yeah. know, and, and like I said, I, I, we do the best we can. I mean, that's that that is one of the downfalls of this is, you know, if they just right. see the verse popped up there, they don't know what chapter or book it's from. Mm -hmm. But uh, does does it have a, a deal where you can do like a Bible tree on this side where it has the the book and chapter? Uh. Right. You, well, yeah, not really. You, you, it has a drop-down menu where you can go to each okay. book and then chapter and then verse. But uh, it's well, I might show you eSword because okay. eSword, you can uh, uh, enlarge the type, uh, go s just like you've got the blue box here mm -hmm. too. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and it also has a tree over here that's got the list of the books, and it would be highlighted which one you're using okay. as well as the chapter and so, then you can see the verse numbers. But, but that's, and that's the kind of information we're looking for because, like I said, you know, people want to know that right. what we're giving is from the Bible. And it's free. So, uh, okay. It's free, so, so uh, you might download it and just try it sometime. Okay, uh, all right. It's, it's so good. Great call. But anyway, all right, yeah. A lot of good information coming out just out of that one thing. So, uh, all right, well, let's uh, let's see. We got, oh, we're out of time. 
Sam? Are we? We're out of time. It's 10 o'clock. Oh. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. I didn't realize time, <laughs> as a frog says, time's fun when you're having flies. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me get back over here <laughs> to our uh, screen here. And we want you to know that we are involved in a tent meeting. Come out and, and visit us the tent. The last night is 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, hope to see you there. Stay tuned for our religious review at 10.30 after the news. We'll see you on the other side with Michael Robertson. Thank you. Have a good night. Weather, and we'll find out just what kind of weather you'll find.